Donald Goins Horse Sign, Chapter 6 After being awake all night and most of the weekend, Jessie and I were in a hurry to get home to bed Sunday morning when she finished work. The square working people in the neighborhood had started drifting by on their way to church, dressed up in their Sunday's best. We passed Milton with his parents coming down the sidewalk. He winked at me, but I refused to acknowledge it since he was damn near grown and still too frightened to speak when he was on the side of his mother. His mother made some type of comment, what a shame, but we were walking too fast to hear all of what she said. Jesse seemed as tired as I was. We ran up the stairs to our flat. She was halfway undressed before I could close the door. Her blouse was tossed over the back of a chair and she had wiggled out of her skirt and tossed it on the couch. I was in the process of running her some bath water when somebody started banging on the door. Before I could get there, Jesse opened the door wearing only half her slip and bra. Tony rushed into the room with tears streaking down his cheeks. Jesse, he sobbed. You gotta come, Jesse. Mom's done took an overdose. Jesse, and ain't nothing I do seems to help her. For the first time in my life, I realized that Tony really cared about his mother though there had never been the harmony between them that there was between Jesse and me. From the many times I had been over to his house, I had yet to notice anything other than indifference between the two. Idly, I wondered how Jesse would refuse to go. I knew she didn't particularly care for Tony's mother, especially not enough to go back out after working all night. To my surprise, she simply turned and began to put back on her skirt and blouse. Unexpected as this was, even more surprising was the fact that she didn't even curse. In less than 10 minutes, we were climbing the steps to the four-room apartment where Tony lived. The door was already open when we got there. The woman who stayed across the hall was standing in the doorway crying. She looked at Jesse and shook her head. It's too late, honey. She done passed away. Tony rushed into the bedroom. Jesse and I followed silently. There wasn't anything anyone could do for her. She lay on the bed, decently covered, with her eyes open. Even for someone as inexperienced as I, the awareness of death in the room was inescapable. The tears that Tony shed seemed inexhaustible. Tears rolled down Jesse's cheek, smearing her makeup. Everyone was crying but me. I turned and left the bedroom. This was a new experience for me, and I was really shook up. I needed some fresh air to remove the smell of death from my nostrils. Without stopping in the living room, I crossed the carpet and opened the door leading to the hallway. Before I could get through the door, two burly policemen came marching into the room. Behind them came the elderly couple who lived downstairs. Is this the boy? The last officer asked the woman following them. I shook my head. This time I knew I wasn't the boy they wanted. No, nah, she answered. That ain't him. One of the officers went into the bedroom. In a few moments, he reappeared with Tony and Jesse. Before long, the apartment was full of people, most of them police officers. Jesse went over in the corner and talked to the detective. I saw her write out something on a slip of paper and hand it to him. Then she came over and heard it Tony and me out of the room. We walked back home in silence. Jesse in the middle with her arms around both of us. The sadness of the occasion overwhelmed us, leaving room for sleep only. The week following the funeral, our way of living became to some extent more orthodox. Jesse stopped working at night and got a daytime job in the cleaners. She wouldn't allow Tony and me to gamble anymore. Plus, we had to be in the house by 8 o'clock every night. We were becoming frustrated by this imposed curfew, and this frustration showed in our relations with Jesse and everyone else. Jesse was responsive and sensitive to our feelings, but she would not tolerate any disrespect. She continued diligently with her job while making us walk a straight line. But all her efforts were in vain. After after Tony had been with us for a week and a half, a policewoman stopped by the house. 
Tony and I had just come in from school. Jesse was still at work, so the woman put us in her car and drove over to the cleaners. The woman went into the cleaners and came out after a short while, followed by Jesse, who seemed to be pleading with her. It was the first time I had ever seen her beg anyone. I hoped it would be the last time. The harder she seemed to beg, the more the woman would shake her head in refusal. Tony realized how useless her pleas were before I did. He opened the car door and got out. Taking Jesse's hand, he kissed it slowly. She turned and stared at him, surprised. It's no use, Jesse, he said. I'll always remember how hard you tried for me, though. She drew him close and wrapped her arms around him, tears in her eyes as she kissed him. It was like a hammer hitting me when I realized that Tony was being taken away. I jumped out of the car. We stood on the sidewalk and hugged each other, our tears flowing unshamedly. Had I known it would be years before we would meet again, I still could not have wept harder. After the woman left with Tony, Jessie went in and quit her job. On the way home, she tried to joke about the job, but I believe in my heart that she would have stopped hustling and kept her job if it would have helped keep Tony. Jessie bought a bottle of gin, and that night, she got roaring drunk. At times, she would laugh and shout. At other times, she would cry. When she attempted to go work drunk, I went and got Big Mama, and she helped me bring Jessie home and put her to bed. For a while, I was consumed with loneliness. After my initial shock about Tony wore off, I resumed gambling and petty stealing. Had I been an introvert, I, put, I probably would have been more sensitive to my close friend's problem. But after really appraising the situation, I realized that sen- sentiment was useless. Even before Jesse advised me to quit worrying because there was nothing we could do, I had reached the same conclusion. In the slums, you have too many problems of your own to cultivate other people's trouble. Usually, I spent most of my leisure time on Hastings. But since I was becoming so well known to the hustlers who hung out on the street, I had to go farther to find my action. One day, I wandered into a small restaurant on Brush. A tall, slim, light-skinned woman was bent over picking up some trash. I leaned on the counter to admire her legs better. She was bow-legging and wired across the rump. Her hair was raving black and hung down on her back. I knew she hadn't heard me come through the door because it had become a habit of mine always to enter as silently as possible. She must have sensed my presence behind her because she turned suddenly and caught me staring in fascination. She seemed startled at first, but her look was bold and penetrating. Suddenly I became uncomfortable. She had dark green eyes, which reminded me of a cat's, and a long, keen nose. Her complexion was the color of burnt copper, and to me she looked like the goddess of love. Usually I could stare at a woman and make her drop her eyes, but this time I had to drop mine. She seemed to undress me with those green eyes, and I got the impression of something cold and hard about her. I pushed my hair back off my forehead and gave her my innocent smile to fake her out. She smiled in return, revealing lovely teeth, and the cattish look disappeared. After our first meeting, I began to stop by the restaurant every day. I knew that Fatima liked me, even though there was a 10-year difference in our ages. One afternoon, I found her sitting at a table by herself, dressed in her street clothes. This was the first time I had seen her without a white uniform. The green dress clung to her body. It was cut low in the front, and I could see the roundness of her breast. My breath caught in my throat, and I could feel my blood rushing to my head desire for this woman had become an obsession. I wanted to possess her completely. She stared up at me and I knew she could see the anxiety in my eyes. Without speaking, she slipped out of her chair and stood in front of me. We were the same height, but the heels she wore caused her to tower above me. Taking my hand, 
She led me from the restaurant. The other waitress stared after us curiously. Fatima waved down a cab. When we got in, I settled down on the seat beside her. As the cab jumped in and out of traffic on its way across town, her hand found mine on the seat and she placed it between her legs. I was in seventh heaven and to this day I cannot recall the location of the apartment she took me to. We entered the apartment and stopped inside the door. Somehow she managed to close the door and slip into my arms in the same smooth motion. I could feel her tongue slipping around inside my mouth. It felt like a hot flame and spear. Everywhere it touched, it aroused erotic emotions. I had been kissed by girls many times, but nothing like this. Her mouth was hot. Her breath felt like a hot wind blowing upon my neck. I could feel her body radiating heat through her dress. She slipped out of my embrace and, pulling me by the arm, led me into her room. We both began to remove our clothes quickly. Fatima finished undressing first. She had me remove my pants and lightly shoved me back up on the bed. The room was well furnished. The walls had been lately painted, a shocking pink, while the dresser and matching pieces were snow white. It was a showroom, displaying the feminine traits of its occupant. I could feel her kissing me tenderly on the legs and thigh. She removed my silk shorts, and I heard her catch her breath in surprise. I smiled because I knew what had given her a shock. I was aware that nature had been exceptionally nice to me in a certain department. Suddenly, I could feel her hot breath on my privates, and I began to tingle all over. The boys and I had discussed blowjobs before, and while I had spoken on the subject like an expert, this was my first experience. Wow. It was like standing up in the bed while lying down. My head and my heels were the only things touching the bed. I felt like screaming but held back in anticipation. At the final moment, I grabbed her head and pushed it against and held it to me at the same time. Later, I flopped back on the bed exhausted. Fatima got up and went into the bathroom. After washing up, she returned to the bedroom and asked, Would you care for a drink? I nodded in agreement and watched the way of her sway, her hips, as she walked into the living room. In a few moments, she returned, carrying two water glasses filled to the brim. I tasted the drink she had given to me. It was whiskey mixed with very little soda. I had drunk wine before, but never any strong spirits because the burning stuff would cause tears to spring into my eyes. I started to set the drink down on the table beside the bed. Fatima caught my hand and pushed the drink towards me. Be a big boy, honey. I ain't standing for no shit about you not getting high with me, she said huskily. I didn't want her to know I hadn't drunk anything stronger than wine, so I turned up the glass and drained it. It was so strong it almost took my breath. Somehow, I managed to hold the drink down. Fatima emptied her glass, then lay beside me, and we kissed for a while. Suddenly, she got back up and went to refill the glasses. I really didn't want another drink. But my not wanting to reveal my inexperience caused me to try to match drinks with her. Sitting cross-legged on the bed, Fatima began to shake out some white powder onto a magazine. I watched her in dread. I had never snorted drugs before, but I knew them when I saw them. Removing a book of matches from the table, she tore off a strip from the back cover. Taking the strip and putting a crimp in the middle, she used it like a shovel to scoop up some of the white drug. Holding one nostril, she put the powder into the other one and snorted. The powder disappeared as if it was magic. She refilled the quill and pushed it towards me. I turned my head sideways and sat up on the side of the bed. Don't be afraid, honey. It's only a little cocaine, she whispered. Her laughter following low and husky. I trembled with an unknown fear. 
I could hear Jesse's warning and roar in my head. Don't ever take any drug other than reefer. The small amount Fatima had taken didn't seem to disturb her much. So I tried a little bit. The more I snorted, the higher I became. Her hands roaming over my body, aroused sensual sensations I had never experienced. Everywhere she touched became sensitive. My nerves became raw, and they tingled with unheard pleasures. I lay back upon the bed as my knee sensibilities blazed with passion. I felt one of her legs rest upon my chest. In a moment, I became aware of my neck being caught in a lengthwise grip between her thighs. She began to thrust her hips with a steady force until the continuous pressure produced a light discharge that seemed to spray my face. Anger and hate twisted inside my gut as the notion ran through my mind that she had made a freak out of me. Pushing her aside, I ran into the bathroom and washed my face thoroughly. I stuck my head under the spigot on the bathtub and rinsed my mouth out. I could hear Fatima standing in the doorway laughing. The more water that ran over my head, the clearer my mind became. As I stood up, I faked a drunk stagger. She laughed again, and I came forward to help. I hit her with a straight right to the head, causing her to tumble all the way back into the room. I followed her quickly, but instead of finding an unconscious woman, I ran straight into a wild cat. Her naked body gleamed in the dim light as she met in the middle of the room, snarling like an animal and clawing like a cat. I shot hook after hook to her head. She was bleeding from nose and mouth, and for a moment, I had doubts about being able to whip this grown woman. She got a grip on my hair and dug her claws into my cheek. I could feel the pain as she raked the side of my face. Remembering that the best way to stop a woman was to hit her in the stomach, I shot her left and right to her gut. She folded up like a bag. I put one on her exposed chin. She exploded against the wall. Most of the fight was out of her as she sank to the floor, but I had no intention of quitting now. I walked over to the closet and removed the coat hanger. As I twisted the wire together, her eyes followed me the way a hurt animal watches the killer. She began to whimper as I picked up a pillowcase and wrapped it around my hand so the wire couldn't cut me. Her scream seemed to shake the walls as I laid into her. I continued beating her until I was exhausted. I sat on the edge of the bed resting as I watched her crawl across the floor towards me. She began to kiss my feet passionately with whimpers of pleasure escaping from her with each caress. When she kissed her way up to my knee, I kicked her in the head, knocking her back to the floor. I knelt down across her body and slapped her across the face. Then I started to ravish her savagely. She dug her nails into my back while her screams shattered the silence, but I was deaf to her cries and continued to rape her. <laughs>